we'll be doing a fiber optic cable 101 uh, and uh, let's jump right into it. So uh, in the world of fiber optics, not only are there just hundreds of different designs available within each kind of design family, there can be hundreds of different variations. And so it can be kind of hard to to discern what kind of cable exactly you need. And so that's kind of the purpose of, of this presentation is to kind of help you figure out the questions and things you should be thinking about when you when it comes to you know picking a design for for your application. So we're going to approach this uh, by application. So we'll start with the transmission world, the distribution substation and fiber to the home, and then a few special cases. So here we have kind of a diagram of like, you know, standard transmission line. So we've got OPGW, uh, OPPC optical phase conductor, ADSS, underground cables, and as well as uh, some wrapped cables. And we'll 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 talk about each each of these different cables as they apply to the transmission world. So firstly, the most common uh, cable we have is OPGW. Um, it's it has lots of advantages here in the transmission world. It's, it's conceptually it's easy to replace shield wire with OPGW. It's, it's kind of its its purpose. It's a it's a proven technology. It's been around longer than I have, 30 years. Um, it has excellent availability here in the U.S. There's many suppliers, many places to get it. Um, and it has a wide range of wide range of designs available for whatever uh, you need, really. And you can kind of see here to the right, we have the three uh, design families of OGW: the center tube design your standard stranded design and the aluminum pipe design. Um, we go over these uh, in more detail in another one of our webinars. Um, so, you know, you can you can catch one of those at a later date or you can go watch uh, a previous um, a recording of the webinar. Um, and then you can expect a very long service life, 40, 40 plus years. Um, it, it's a very robust cable, it lasts a very long time. Um, and uh, it, it it gets the job done. Uh, it does have a few disadvantages, though. Uh, from a cost perspective, it's much more expensive, just by the nature of it using metal versus uh you know polyethylene or you know plastics. Um, and for installation, in most cases, you need to do a line outage, and um, most people try to avoid outages, or it can be hard to get outages. Um, live line installation is possible. Um, but it's not, you don't really see it as much. It it, it has safety concerns um, and a lot of contractors aren't really willing to do it. So most people stick to just, you, you need an outage to install it. It's it's just your well-rounded standard go-to solution um, in the, uh, the transmission world. Uh, Next up is the ADSS cables or all dielectric self-supporting cables. Like OPGW has several different variations on its design. Um, you've got your double jacket designs with either aramid or fiberglass. And then, you know, if you don't need something as robust, you can go with a single jacket design again with aramid or fiberglass. And then you can even use FRP uh, in, in lieu of either aramid or fiberglass. Um, it's conceptually easy to add ADSS below your phase conductors. Um, it's like OPGW, you have proven technologies. It's been around 30 plus years. Also has excellent availability and multiple manufacturing sources. And it also has a wide range of designs. In addition to the different designs here, you can get different jacket properties. properties. Um, and in some cases, if you need tracking resistance, um, you, that's also available. So it, it, it like OPGW, is a very versatile uh, cable that can be used in a multitude of different applications. Um, it's more economical than OPGW. It's it's cheaper, and you can install it without taking an outage. Um, this, this comes with a little bit of trade-off. Um, 
it's not as robust as the metal cable, so it has a, a little bit of a lower service life at around 20 years. And it's more vulnerable to damage than the metal cables. So in some areas where there's lots of birds or squirrels, you can get damage from critters. And then you can get damage from, from people shooting the critters, shotgun damage. Or maybe rifle damage, just any sort of gun damage, really. Um, it's it's a it's a very solid solution when when you when you have an application that can't use OPGW or maybe you can't get your hands on some OPGW. Uh, optical phase conductor. This is a, a, another option. Um, it it makes sense that like shield wire, you could replace phase conductor with uh, an optical phase conductor. It's you know it's a phase conductor with optical in it. Um, it's a variation of the OPGW design, and like OPGW, it has a very long service life at around 40 years. But it does come with a lot of disadvantages, which is why you don't really see it as much. Um, again, just like the OPGW, it has much higher relative cost. It has much more limited applications today. You, we haven't really seen it that much. And access to the fiber is much harder. You either have hot enclosures, or uh, in, a, in an isolated enclosure, you can have, um, well, bo both of those enclosures have difficulty when it comes to maintenance. You either have to um, power down another, another outage. And um, if you do have issues with the cable, not only do you lose communication, but you also lose power. So you, you've got the double whammy. It also has limited uh, operate uh, operating temperature. Um, so if you're operating in, in an area where you need higher operating temperature, um, it, this this isn't an option. But it, it is an option when you can when you don't when you you can neither use OPGW nor ADSS. And here we have some examples of this is the hot enclosure for some OP, OPPC. And then here's the isolated enclosure. So you have you have your hot, and then you have insulators, and then from from here down it's isolated. But if your insulators fail, then then you have both a, a power and a communication a down. And then lastly, we have the uh, underground cables. Um, uh, these cables are pretty similar to the ADSS. You know, some of them might be even identical. Like this is, you know, double jacket, single jacket, and then you have down here the uh, armored, armored design. Um, again, this is a proven design, uh, excellent availability, lots of sources, and then there's a wide range of different uh, cables. Yeah, you have, you know, direct bury cables, armored cables. So this is something you you could. You could just direct bury, or you could run it in some duct. Uh, all these cables could be, you know, run in duct or micro duct or blown in. Uh, like like the ADSS cables, you can install it without taking an outage, and they have a good service life of around 25 years. Um, underground cables are a little bit more vulnerable than you think they would be. Um, <clears throat> uh, the the biggest enemy of uh, of uh, underground cables would be people digging, uh, backhoes especially. Um, and then uh, again, like in ducting applications, you, you can have you know rats and stuff getting in there ducting and chewing up the cables. So uh, another weak point there is rodent, rodents. Um, insulation costs can be higher uh, when you're digging, but the cable itself is pretty economical. So if you have existing ducts, um, you know, you've already avoided the, the high installation costs if you're just going to blow it through some existing duct. In the transmission world, this is more of a, a special case and situation. And then um, the very last thing we have for transmission is the 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 raft dielectric cables. Um, you can just wrap this cable around existing ground wire. It, it's a, in theory, a good retrofit uh, option uh, available. And so here in this picture, you can see a, a wrapping machine wrapping some uh, some cable around uh, a grounding wire. It has a much lower service life, though. Uh, 
around 10 years and some utilities have accepted less than five years. And it's very vulnerable to damage because the cable is much smaller and lighter for it to be able to be wrapped. And so by its nature, it has lower protection. Again, vulnerable to shotguns, birds, and squirrels. Uh, shorter reel lengths, which means more splices, which means more splice lost and cost. And then over time, the cable can kind of bunch up in, in the mid-span, um, which can lead to increased attenuation over time. It has limited supply, not many people supply it. And then in addition to, to the cable itself, you have to get a wrapping machine or maybe you have to rent one. Again, that comes down to availability. And then um, how do you, how do you hand, you, you have increased handling when you're going between, between structures or uh, spans for clearances. Um, or I wouldn't say we're very fond of th this as a solution. I, I would, I would try and push someone away from this. Um, kind of use it like if you, if this is your very last option. So now we're in uh, distribution. So here we have a nice diagram. You've got ADSS either above or below the, the neutral wire. You have lash cables. And then for the neutral wire, you have uh, optical, uh, sorry, optical neutral wire, wire. And then you have mass cables. And then again, we have the uh, the underground cables. So, so again, we have ADSS. Um, again, it's for this application, it it makes the most sense. You know, you see it everywhere. It's um, again a proven technology. It, it has a wide range of. Of, of designs like we discussed already and you can install it again without taking an outage for for distribution there aren't really any disadvantages but um and this is kind of a common theme with these these kind of cables uh they are vulnerable um to, to damage um birds shotguns and especially squirrels we see a lot of rodent problems um but it's the standard go-to solution for for distribution Um, so let's, let's, you know, talk about some uh, pros and cons. Um, it has greatly reduced, uh, make ready costs. You don't need to ground it. Um, you're not competing against other companies for, for space. It's not in the communication zone. Um, it has very little maintenance after installation. Um, and then in most cases, you don't need additional people for, for installation. It's, it's a similar installation as to, to conductor. Uh, the cons, you, you do need power utility crews to install it. Um, and like I've mentioned many times and many times more, uh, it's vulnerable to shotgun damage from and damage from squirrels and rodents. And then you can run into some limitations when it comes to, to sag, when it comes to ice and wind conditions, depending on where you're at. And so you may need to think of another option if if it if if uh, it's it's too much. You know, it can be maybe the design you need to to meet your sag requirements and ice and wind are, are are too great and the cable becomes too expensive or maybe your poles can't handle the increased weight um whatever it may be um that is that is something you need to consider uh lashed cable um for lashed cable you can use uh basically any cable you would use in a duct um again you can use armored cable here in this application, um, and that can help kind of mitigate the uh, the shotgun or bird slash squirrel damage. Um, the cable itself is pretty economic and can be cheaper than ADSS in some cases. And like ADSS, it has a wide uh, variety of designs available. Again, you can install it without taking an outage, and you can use telco uh, installation crews instead of power crews for, for the last applications. And you can overlash, so you can lash over existing cables to add capacity. Um, and it also has a very good uh, service life of around uh, 20 years. So disadvantages. Um, you could potentially have high make ready costs. Could be as much as $50,000 per mile or more, which is quite a lot. 
Um, higher installation and operating and maintenance costs. So you have a two step install, so you have to install your, uh, your messenger wire and then you can have uh, broken lashing, which you can see here, you know, if your lashing fails. And then uh, your messenger has to be uh, bonded to ground, has to be grounded. Um, and then if you have metallic cables, you can have induced voltage into uh, the metallic armor cables. So you may need to, to ground those as well. And then you have competition in the, in the telco space. Um, but it's often a, a good solution, and we see it all over the U.S. I, I see it everywhere. Um, another option is a uh, figure eight cable. Um, you can kind of think of it as like a pre-lash cable. It comes with its own integrated messenger wire, as you can see here. Um, and it has some of the advantages uh, from uh, the from the previous cables. It um, you can install it without taking an outage. Um, you can maybe install it or with telco crews if they're trained or but or you can use power crews. So it, it's versatile there with, with who can install it. Uh, you can overlash it to add capacity. Um, the the integrated messenger kind of makes it uh, uh, resistant to the to the if the if the lashing fails, it, it will it will support itself because of the the integrated messenger wire here. And then you can also armor these cables to uh, you can add the the armoring as you've seen in the previous you know the, the corrugated steel armor here. You can add to these. Uh, uh, figure eight cables to to give it the increased um uh, resistance to to shotgun and, and and bird damage um it's not bad from an economic standpoint it's it's fairly uh, i don't want to say it, it's fairly cheap uh, in comparison to the other cables and then it, like the other cables it has a pretty good service life um but it also has the potentially high make ready costs um because of its kind of oddball shape, it, it's slower to sh uh, to string and kind of slower to splice, splice prep because you got to remove the, the messenger wire uh, when you're getting ready to splice. And then the messenger has to be bonded to ground. And then again, you're competing in the telco space, but it's another option uh, available to everyone. And then we have uh, undergrade, underground cables. Um, there's a wide range of different uh, designs available for for various project requirements. Um, you know, you can put it in a duct, you can bury it, um, and then you can also you know blow it in through micro duct, or you can have it pre-installed in duct, and then run the duct with the cable already installed in the duct. Um, and then you can install it without taking an outage, and like the other cables, it has a fantastic uh, service life. And again, uh, disadvantages to underground cable are people digging and not calling 811 and then digging up your cable um, and then uh, rodents again. And then if you're in the, you know, tornado alley, tornadoes just ripping everything up. But I feel like tornadoes are uh, a threat to all cable, <laughs> not just underground cable. Um, but when it comes to underground cables, you do much have much higher installation costs. But again, the cable itself is fairly cheap. Um, it can it can sometimes be a good good solution depending on what what your project needs. And then we have uh, optical neutral wire, uh, like some of the other uh, like optical uh, OPPC um, and OPGW. It you it makes sense to you know replace um, a neutral wire with an optical component. So it's a, again it's a variation of the OPGW and. OPPC designs, and it has excellent uh, service life, 40 plus years. And uh, it's not as vulnerable as the uh, the plastic cables. Um, it's much more robust, you know, by nature of it being metal. Um, but again, it has the disadvantage of being much more expensive, and it has uh, very limited applications. Uh, much, it's it's normally just much easier to use ADSS. Um, it's much cheaper, and, and or, you know. It, because it's it's kind of an oddball design, it's um, 
you know, you need different hardware and you have different work practices. You know, you have to make crews aware of, of the optical neutral wire. And then you have to, yeah, you have to distinguish between standard neutral wire and optical neutral wire because you don't want a crew to accidentally just cut a neutral wire. And, oh, it turned out it was optical neutral wire. Um, and then the reality of voltage and current on op optical neutral wire. So again, you have hot enclosures or an isolated enclosure, but it it introduces an element of of uh, change. So if you're if you've been running ADSS for you know, 20 plus years, um, it can be kind of hard to transition to something like optical neutral wire uh, when it comes to training and um, making your crews aware. Um, but it's again, it's another option for for available to people to use. And then we have optical messenger wire. So like like the other cables, it, it makes sense to replace just a static wire with an optical wire. Um, again, it's a variation of the OPGW, OPNW, and OPPC designs. Um, again, it's metal, so it has resistance to shotguns, birds, and squirrels, and then it can be overlashed to high capacity. So you have you have your messenger wire, which also has communication capacity, and then you're lashing things on top of it. Um, Again, it's much more expensive than dielectric cables. Um, and then in most cases, it's easier just to use ADSS or just last to existing uh, messenger wire. And then again, you have to dis distinguish this optical messenger wire from existing uh, messenger wire or neutral wire. It's easy, but again, it's it's different. And sometimes you want to keep things simple as opposed to more complex. And then uh if you're using if you're lashing uh, uh armor cable you have to be aware of in, induced voltage and current so you have to bond it to ground now we have the uh, substation uh, applications so here we have opcw uh, splice enclosures and then duct cables to and from control houses and then more dss um, so common practices here, uh, error cables come into the substation to a splice point, so right here. And then uh, induct cables take it from, from there to the control houses. So you got your splice enclosures and then you know, these go to your control houses. Uh, all dielectric underground cables in conduit are, are typically installed in conduit. Uh, you can you can also just use ADSS if you already have it on hand, you know, to run through the uh, through the through the conduit. But you cannot use metallic cables because of uh, risk of uh, well not risk but because of induced voltage and current. So you you absolutely cannot use any sort of metallic cable here. Uh, some things to consider: uh, non-metallic armor cables could be used to direct bury or if you're having problems with rodents. Uh, microducting could also be used to add a capacity to existing ducts and allow for increased capacity in the future. And then newer designs also support sensing and data acquisition um, to help provide advanced, you know, communications for advanced uh, control systems for, for smart grid. So we'll, we'll start with the, uh, the microducts. Um, you've got your Polyethylene uh, subducts, microducts, and then uh, two bundles. Um, you got many different options when it comes to to microducts. You just kind of help illustrate, you know, the underlying, you know, concepts. But just to, you want to optimize your your conduit space. Um, and then uh, fiber to the home. Um. Basically, any cable we talked about in distribution uh, can be used in the fiber to the home application. Um, but uh, which type you use is based on, you know, the advantages and disadvantages as a, as applied to your to your you know service territory or how you run things. Uh, the fiber counts to use will will follow from your from your own logically from your own network architecture. Um, density is typically a big factor. Um, and then a lot of things we see when it comes to fiber to the home are, are drop cables, and there are a variety of different uh, drop cables we'll get into. So for the underground or for the aerial 
uh, drop cables, we have the round type, uh, the fly or butterfly uh, type, and then figure eight. And then underground, the options for underground are the same as we've, we've seen in previous slides. Um, but uh, when it comes to fiber of the home, you, you, you can kind of, it, it comes to do, are you going to run in conduit or is it, are you going to do a direct Perry application? So uh, drop cable options. We have the flat butterfly type cables. Oh, I typically just call them flat, flat drop. I find it much easier to say flat versus butterfly. Um, but um, it, I think they're called butterfly because it kind of, the cross section kind of sort of looks like a butterfly because you've got the two uh, supporting members and then the, the fiber itself here in the middle. Um, it's the most popular option we see by far. Um, it's also the easiest prep out of all three options. And it has widely available uh, universal hardware. Uh, next up is the uh, the figure eight cables. Um, it's the next most popular, but um, I use the word popular kind of loosely. It's used mostly in uh, rural settings where you need kind of longer aerial spans between uh, between poles. And uh, when it comes to figure eight cables, you should really get hardware recommendations from your cable manufacturer, or you should have them blessed uh, by your cable manufacturer. Um, and then round cable, uh, when it comes to drop cables, is the least popular. We don't see that very much. Um, it's prepped the same as any other round cable. And it's capable of the longest spans, because you can kind of think of it as like micro ADSS. Um, it can be designed to whatever your span lengths need to be. And then again, uh, your dead ends have to be blessed by your by your cable manufacturer. Um, and with any of these cables, you can add uh, tonable capability using a using a tracer wire. So, uh, like we mentioned earlier, um, direct berry versus conduit. Wh which should you choose? Uh, direct berry typically has lower overall costs, um, and you have multiple options for armor when it comes to direct berry cables, but you will need to ground uh, any any cables that could potentially bring voltage back to electronics. And then armor can be used to locate, it's kind of its own, you know, it, it's built in tonability if it's armored. Um, conduit has higher overall costs, um, but it can provide better protection for cables, and it can also make repair and replace faster too. Um, there's no grounding necessary. And you can also use ADSS cable in a duct. So if you already have ADSS lying around, um, you can use your existing ADSS, or maybe you, you just want to keep one type of cable around, you can use ADSS. Um, and then you can install multiple ducts at a time during your installation uh, for expansion or even leasing opportunities. And then you also have the ability to use micro micro ducts to run multiple micro cables in the same conduit. So again, optimizing your conduit space uh, to to make you know to make more money or just to have better uh, optimization of space. And then we have the uh, the special situations. Um, this is kind of a, an old advertisement, uh, older than I am. Uh, hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, uh, specialty cables don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us make them your way. <laughs> um, bonus points if you can uh, recognize this. Um, for the special situations, we have sensing. Um, you can use fiber optic cable. There are many ways to sense and collect data. Um, just about anything you can imagine using an optical cable. Um, there's submersible cables. Uh, you need to go uh, across a lake or a river. Um, you can just get a submersible cables um, and, and run it that way. Um, or if you need power um, and fiber in the same cable, you can have both fiber and power in the same cable. It can be done. Um, so what kind of drives, like what are the main factors when it comes to cable design? And we'll break that down by uh, by fiber or by cable type. Um, so in the OPW sphere, uh, you always see fiber count um, 
ball current and diameter. Um, those are kind of the, the biggest main factors here. It's kind of the essential you know, what, what you need anyway. Oftentimes we'll see uh, sag and tension requirements, so like strength to weight ratio. Uh, design type, so maybe you want plastic tubes versus stainless steel tubes. These are kind of like preferential things, well, mainly uh, design type. And then sometimes you'll you'll see people that require like a specific lightning withstand capability or maybe some other, you know, maybe you need non-specular cable. Um, that's another uh, thing you can you, you should you should consider uh, depending on your your project. Um, but like with OBGW, uh, fiber, fiber count and fall current are kind of king here and diameter as well when it comes to you know hardware. Uh, for ADSS, again, uh, fiber count, you always see uh, max span length is what we typically see. So most people, you know, hey, I need a thousand foot spans. And then uh, line voltage, because line voltage will help you determine if you need a tracking resistant jacket or not. And then oftentimes uh, you'll see like sag as a percent of span. So 1% initial sag, 1.5%. I think 1% is the standard here in the US. And then uh, sometimes you'll see a need for rodent protection. Uh, for the underground last and figure eight cables, uh, the main factor here is fiber count. Uh, sometimes you'll see some diameter requirements. Um, and then uh, in this other category, we don't really, these are kind of the main the main factors here. There's not really much else when it comes to the underground and last, last cables. Uh, drop cables, uh, the main factor is span length. Um, and then every now and then you'll see tonability and then fiber count kind of gets fleshed out later because these are kind of lower fiber counts like six, four, two, twelve. Um, and then special specialty cables, uh, the main factor here is application. What do you, what is your, you know, your like sensing application or what, what basically what is the application and what are you using it for? Because that'll be the main kind of design, driving design factor there. And then as well as fiber count. And then in the specialty uh, sphere, you can run into different, you know, fiber types. You know, you, do you need just standard single mode? Do you need multi mode? Um, yeah. So just uh, some other things to consider. Um, that's the uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'll open it up to the questions now. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the in the chat, and we'll try and get them answered for you. Are butterfly drops tonable by themselves? Or let's back up. Um, no, but they can be. So you could replace one or both of these. In, in this picture you see here, um, these are FRP rods, but you could replace those with a metallic uh, strength member and it would it would add uh, tonability to the to the butterfly drop, yes. And then please remember uh, the quiz for the PDH credits will be sent in a follow-up email. So please uh, be on the lookout for that. And uh, if you need a copy of the presentation, please let us know and we'll send it to you.
Do we request a copy of the presentation once we receive the email? Uh, yeah, you can you can just reply directly to the email saying you want a copy and we'll send it to you. Yeah, no problem. Any more questions? Okay, well, um, I guess we'll we'll go ahead and close out. Oh, well, looks like we have another question. Is somebody typing? Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. I hope hope you guys learned something today. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, please uh, keep an eye on on your email for the uh, for the quiz. And uh, yeah, hope you guys join us for the next webinar uh, we have in May. Uh, so have a good rest of your afternoon, and uh, I hope I gave you some insight into the world of fiber optic cable design.